Chapter 2, group, um, Frequency Distributions. This is part 2 of the lecture, and it pertains to group frequency distribution tables. So when we have a large data set, meaning we have many raw scores, a simple frequency table is not going to be sufficient. For example, if we had 100 different x values, and we wanted to present data in terms of how often each of those x values occurred, we learned x values, and let's say it was 100 all the way down to um, a value of 0, right? We would have 100 values illustrated and then its corresponding frequency. <clears throat> you should note that that would be a very extensive list, a very long table, and it would defeat the purpose of a frequency table. So, um, since I'm speaking of the purpose of something, it's always helpful to understand the function, the purpose of the term that we're learning, the new um, definition. A frequency distribution, again, the function or purpose of it is to organize data and to summarize it. So if we have a large data set, it's not going to be helpful to list every x value in its corresponding frequency. So a solution to that is to con construct a group frequency distribution, which helps us consolidate large data sets into a smaller table. So again, to review. The purpose of a frequency table is to organize and summarize data. The purpose of a group frequency distribution table is to consolidate large sets of data to make it easier to read. So if the number of categories is very large, they are combined or grouped to make the table easier to read or understand. However, information is lost when categories are grouped. So there is a disadvantage when we do construct a group frequency distribution, and that disadvantage is that the exact value that we're representing as the x value is lost in terms of um, the frequency that's denoted. So, you know, we may have a range, so let me just show you what I mean by that. So instead of the actual value of 100, Let's say we have just a range of values. I'm just going to make up a range 50 to 59. And let's say that occurred, the frequency of that range of values was equal to 5. And now that we've grouped those values, we don't really know how exactly those five individuals are distributed into this range. In other words, all five could have um, been represented by a score of 50. All of them could have been 59, or they could be evenly distributed across the values of 50 to 59. So again, the disadvantage is that we're not really sure where those five individuals reside within this range of x values. But the advantage is that large sets of data can be combined into a table and um, patterns can be detected more easily. So. If you can think, the advantages um, outweigh the disadvantages in terms of not knowing exactly where those scores reside um, in terms of the frequency. And when we're constructing group frequency distribution tables, we have to adhere to certain requirements. So the mandatory guidelines are as follows. All intervals must be the same width. And we um, use the notation of lowercase i as um, an illustration of width. So again, the range. In that previous example, I put the values of 50 to 59. That's the width of that interval. We need to make the bottom or low score in each interval. So again, I had shown you an interval of 50 to 59. So that's the interval. It's the I size of the range of values that are um, captured. Um, in that class interval. And the low score, again, in this case would be 50, uh, should be a multiple of the width. And so just to, you know, to point out a, certain, a couple things here, the range of 50 to 59, if I were to say, tell me what i is equal to, what is the width of that class interval? Many of us would say, that it's um, 9 values. You would take 59 minus 50, 
and say that it encompasses nine values, but if we were to count it out, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, if you count on your fingers, you'd, you'd recognize that the range of values is actually equal to 10. There are 10 values expressed in that interval. So again, many of us may think 59 minus 50 gives us 9, and that's the range of values. But again, counting with 50, beginning with 50 and all the way to 59, it actually encompasses 10 separate x values. So when we talk about this bottom lower score in each interval is a multiple of the interval width. There are certain um, I values that are common, ideal, that we tend to use that I'll discuss in just a second. And um, we want to make sure that that lower number, number is a multiple. I would also say that an additional requirement um, so that it, making or constructing these group frequency distribution tables is easier is that um, it's not only a multiple of the interval width, but evenly divisible. So let's add that. So if I'm saying that i is equal to 10, this lower level, lower um, value, which is actually referred to as the apparent limit, the lower apparent limit, so it is a multiple of 10, right? 50 is a multiple of 10, but it's also evenly divisible by 10. So 50 divided by 10 is evenly divisible um, and by 5. So when you're constructing your group frequency distribution, keep that in mind that the lower apparent limit must be a multiple of the I value that you have set. Um, the next um, rule of thumb, suggested guidelines, so there's mandatory and suggested, is that we have 10 or fewer intervals, um, but we need to use good judgment. So when we talk about intervals, again, I sometimes abbreviate that as CI, number of intervals. So if we're, this is one class interval, 50 to 59, the next one would be 40 to 49, the next one 30 to 39. So how many of these we need, right, is determined by how many class intervals. And typically we want somewhere around 10. Um, more than 10 is, is not ideal, less than 10 is not ideal. 10 is kind of the perfect number, but we won't always have 10 exactly. The closer we get to 10, the, the more ideal the table will um, be. And um, the reason for that is that we won't be losing as much information. Obviously, the more we consolidate information, the more specific information is lost. So 10 seems to be the ideal number of class intervals that helps us still um, have distinction between categories and, and be able to detect um, significant patterns in the data. And we'll need to choose a simple number for the interval width, or i. And the ideal values, so ideal I values include things like 2, 5, 10, 20, 25, 50, and 100. It's very unusual that we in, in this class uh, would use things such as as high as 50 or 100, but those are ideal I values, meaning that we're grouping these intervals by two data points or 100 data points. Um, and the reason these are ideal are because they're easy to count by. We've learned back in, you know, first grade, count by twos, ten, fives, tens, twenties, twenty-fives, fifty, a hundred. It's very easy to do. Therefore, it's easy to construct the apparent limits and construct these intervals um, that we can um, consolidate values of our um, variables into. All right, so when we're constructing a group frequency distribution using discrete variables, um, we're either going to use it con uh, discrete or continuous. So constructing either frequency distributions or group frequency distributions for discrete variables, again, what's our definition of discrete? Meaning Usually it's whole numbers or it could be named categories that cannot be divided into smaller proportions. Um, and it's 
it's viewed as very uncomplicated because individuals in the same recorded score had precisely the same measurements. In other words, there's no discrepancy. The value of um, five individuals in a household, it's always going to be five. It's never going to be a fraction um, or something smaller between the values of four and five. It's going to be a whole number. And the, the score is an exact score. So when we're talking about discrete values, whether it's a simple or group frequency distribution, it's uncomplicated in the sense that we don't need to construct real limits because the discrete variable cannot be divided into a smaller value. Therefore, it doesn't need um, a, a range of values, a cutoff range um, pertaining to a decimal. Continuous variables and frequency distributions. Constructing frequency distributions for continuous variables requires understanding that the score actually re represents an interval. So again, thinking back to the slide that I presented last week of weight. Um, so I may say that my, my weight is 130 pounds, right? Um, and on a good day, it's exactly 130 pounds. On a bad day, it's 130.4 pounds. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. So we recognize that we round to the whole, the whole number because that makes more sense. We don't go around expressing our weight in a decimal. Um, it's usually a whole number. So in that case, if we're working with continuous variables, examples include height and weight and age, um, then we money, then we, we ex recognize it's continuous and we need to set parameters that justify what 130 pounds really is equal to. Um, so we set this range that we refer to as real limits. Usually it's taking 0.5 off and adding 0.5 um, to the higher end. And now when we're talking about group frequency distributions, it'll be a range of apparent limits that help us construct the real limits. And I'll show you an example to help you better understand that. So a given score actually could have been any value within the score's real limits. Um, the recorded value was rounded off to the middle value between the score's real limits, and individuals with the same recorded score probably differed slightly in their actual performance. So again, if I say 100, I weigh 130 pounds and the next person says they weigh 130 pounds and the next person says they weigh 130 pounds, it's very unlikely that we all weigh exactly 130 pounds. There's probably a lot of variation um, in terms of decimal difference of how much we weigh exactly. So we have to take that in con into consideration when we're um, constructing these group frequency distribution. So discrete variable is not going to require real limits, but you will see that when we're working with a continuous variable. All right, so again, just a little more review. Constructing group frequency distributions for continuous variables also requires understanding that a score actually re represents an interval. So again, if we specify any specific value, it actually pertains to the range and interval that we have constructed. Consequently, grouping several scores actually requires grouping several intervals. So we see the construction of the entire table as a result. Parent limits of the, of the class interval are always one unit smaller than the real limits of the group um, of the class interval. So let's say we have a, a parent limits, parent limits equal to, so we set a range of an I equal to, 10. So we say weight of 130, right, to 139. That encompasses 10 different weight values. And the real limits, right, we learned that it's always taking that unit, taking half of it, subtracting it from the lower end, and adding it to the higher end. So the, the real limits for this range would actually be 129.5 pounds to 139.5 pounds. In this question here that's posed, it says, why are the apparent limits always one unit smaller than the real limits? So if again, we, we said that this range encompasses 10 values, and um, we can, again, count on our fingers, 130 to 139, that's 10. 
But what we've done here is extended that by subtracting 0.5 and adding 0.5. So we've extended it by a total of one whole unit. So this is why the real limits um, encompass an additional unit. The range has been increased by 0.5 on either end, on the lower and the upper apparent limit. Um, so again, we answer that question simply by recognizing the real limits extended to set the parameters. Anyone that falls within the range of 129.5 to 139.5 is included in this apparent limit of 130 to 139. I'm going to walk you through um, a simple example from the learning checks. Um, and as a side note, if you aren't doing the learning checks when you read, please start doing them. They are essential to ensuring that you understand um, the reading. And it's a good way to assess your comprehension. If you are able to do the learning checks, get all the questions correct, the answers are provided um, in the reading, then you should move on to the next segment of the chapter. But if you aren't able to successfully complete those learning check questions, you need to go back and reread. Obviously, that takes a lot of time, but it, in the end, it's worth it um, because you will establish those skills necessary to then add on. Every section of the reading presents new skills. And if you just read from beginning to end of a chapter, the likelihood of you um, retaining those skills just by simply reading is very slim. You need to do the exercises um, before you do the homework problem. So I'm going to illustrate one of those learning checks. And again, history shows the students who do do the learning checks get very good grades in this class. Those who don't, don't do very well. So again, um, when you're reading, make sure you take the time to stop, complete the learning checks, reread if necessary, or go on if you've mastered those questions. All right, so here is one of the learning checks from Chapter 2 after the section of Group Frequency Distribution Tables is presented. So it says, place the following scores in a Group Frequency Distribution Table using an interval width of 10, 10 points. So I always pull out what's given. I is equal to 10. Something else that you um, want to note is identify what the sample size is. So how many x values do we have? So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So I have 18 actual scores. This is important um, just to check our work once we've constructed our table when we add the frequency once we've tallied all the um, values in a table. Something that um, I also like to present, an equation that isn't readily used but is very helpful when um, we're trying to ensure we adhere to the requirements of constructing group frequency distribution. So recall that one of the um, recommended guidelines is that you have somewhere around 10 class intervals. The closer you are to 10, the better. And um, one of the things that we can use to determine how many class intervals are going to be produced given a particular I size is to calculate the range. And the equation for that is to take your high score minus your low score. And um, here we have a high score equal to 53, that's our high score. And our low score, the low score is 16. So in your calculator, go ahead and so this is the range of values that we have. So again, we have 18 scores, and they span a range of, of a particular number of, of scores. Um, and we have the range equal to 53 minus 16. And in our calculators, that should equal 37. And that just tells us the span of scores. So think of the range of span of scores. We have 18 scores and they span from a score of 53 to 16, which is 37 values. And um, when we talk about class intervals, remember CI was the number of class intervals. And ideally, we want somewhere close to 10. So an equation we can use to determine 
how many approximately we need. And again, these are all approximations. This number of class intervals equation is an approximation. So again, we ideally want somewhere close to 10. So we can take the class in our range divided by the class interval size that we've we've identified. So in this case we take 37 divide by 10 and now what we have determined and I should put here number of number of class intervals needed to capture all this data would be 3.7 and again this is an approximation I should be more accurate and the notation so approximately we'll need 3.7 class intervals. Obviously we're not going to have a fraction of an interval so we would round up and say we need approximately four class intervals to capture all of these um, data points. And again four that's a lot less than ten so it's not ideal but let's go ahead and construct the table and see what it looks like. So we have our x values and um, I present those equations because you will be asked, um, given a certain data set, what the ideal I value is. And calculating the range and number of class intervals needed will help you determine that. Um, in the homework videos, I, I give you a lot more examples of how to do that. All right, so if we, actually I'm going to move this over just slightly because I'm going to also include real limits when I'm done here. So our x values considered the apparent limits in frequency. And we have our high score. Again, we identified our high score was equal to 53. So to start at the top, we would need to determine the low end of that interval. And again, the requirements is that the lower value must be a multiple of i. And I also included evenly divisible by i. So we ask ourselves, is 53 evenly divisible by 10? No. It could be a multiple of 10. We could do 53 to 63, 73, or backwards, downward, 53, 43, 33. But things get a little sloppy when we do that. So it's better to have that lower limit evenly divisible by 10. So 53 is not evenly divisible by 10. Our highest class interval must include our high score, so we need to go lower. So what is the value less than 53 that's evenly divisible by, by 10? And we should say, and I didn't recognize that 50 is evenly divisible by 10. And then we would go up 10 values, so again including 50, that would take us to 59. And so now we've constructed an interval that includes the high score. That's a requirement. A high score must be in the highest class interval. So we should have a frequency other than zero. And we move our way down. So now we go by multiples of 10. So 40 to 49, 30 to 39. And we go all the way down until we capture our lowest score. We construct an interval that includes our lowest score. So our low score is 16. So then we go 10 to 19. And we wouldn't have to go any lower because we know that 16 falls within this range of 10 to 19. All right, so now let's see how many class intervals did that require. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We had estimated that these values would yield um, four class intervals needed approximately and we actually ended up with five again these are all approximations so it's not always going to be a perfect number but that was close enough again recognizing five isn't that close to ten um, so we'll talk about what we can do with that eye size so that we get closer to that ideal number of ten class intervals but in the meantime let's go ahead and tally the frequency and what I'm going to do here is not necessarily what um, you will see in a table, but it helps us keep track and then we'll see the actual whole number. So values between 50 and 59. Let's go up to our data and we have 50 and 53. So 1, 2, or we would actually see the value of 2. So again, this the tallying is not necessarily appropriate, but I'm just to help, using it to help you identify um, how many scores are in that interval. The range of 40 to 49, so we have 
one, two, three, four, four values. Again, these actual numeric values is the appropriate um, notation. Values from 30 to 39. Let's see how many there are. So here's one, two, three, four, five. So we have five in that range. 20 to 29. One, two, three, four. And then finally, 10 to 19. One, two, and three. Again, this part, just for our sake of, of keeping track, um, would not be demonstrated in a table. The actual whole numbers is what we would see. At this point, it's a good time to make sure no one was left out, that we didn't neglect to include any of the data that was provided. So we had identified initially that we had 18 scores. So let's take the sum of our frequency to make sure that everyone is accounted for and take the summation here of 2 plus um, 4 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3. So the total of the frequency we should get 18. So that's perfect. And it's a good idea to do that to make sure that you didn't leave anybody out. And so now what we've done is constructed our group frequency distribution using class interval size of 10. It yielded five class intervals to capture all of the data from the high score to the low score, a span of 37 scores total, or values, I should say. Um, the other thing, even though this was not asked for, I'm going to show you what the real limits would look like. Let's say if this was a discrete variable, we would be done. But if this was a continuous variable, we would also include the real limit. So it's half a unit below, so it would be 49.5 to 59.5. And this would be 39.5 through 49.5. And 29.5 through... 39.5, 19.5, again multiples of 10, through 29.5, and 9.5 through 19.5. Notice that where this one ends, this one begins, right? So there's that pattern there um, that we see and we will recognize in use when we construct a frequency histogram. It's a bar graph where one value ends, the other one begins, right? Because it's continuous, right? Meaning that where one ends, there really isn't any um, distinction other than we're creating those categories. Um, so where one ends, the other one begins. They bleed together, in other words. So again, here is what we were asked to conduct or construct given the data provided. The next question says, um, let's consider a class interval of 5, so i equal to 5. What do you think that's going to do to the number of class intervals we needed? So again, here, given i is equal to 10, we needed 5 class intervals. If we decrease the class interval size down to 5, are we going to need more or less? The answer is that we're going to need more, right, because the ranges are going to be smaller. And so by decreasing the class interval size, that increases the number of class intervals needed. And it may get us closer to that ideal number of 10 that we talked about. So I'm going to take a moment to erase all of this and start over so that we can use a class interval size equal to 5. Okay, so we're going to use i is equal to... 5 instead of 10. And let's um, look again at the, the range. So we know the range is the high score minus the low score. And high score was 53. We've already identified all of this. 16, so we have a range of 37 values. And um, if we want to determine number of class intervals needed, our equation is the range over i. 
so that would be 37 over 5, and that gives us approximately 37 divided by 5, 7.4. So again, we don't have a fraction, so we would always round up, even though our, our normal rounding rule says anything above 0.5 to the next whole number and anything less lower. Let's just round up because we're saying that we need a fraction of, of an interval, so let's make it into a whole interval. So we're, we're going to construct a, a table with approximately eight class intervals. And let's see how close we are. Again, eight is much closer to ten than the previous example where we needed five class intervals. So by decreasing the class interval size, we increase the number of intervals required. And now we're much closer to the ideal number of ten. All right, so we have our x values and our frequency. And now we are constructing using class interval um, equal to 5. So we take our, our highest score of 53 and ask ourselves, is that evenly divisible by 5? And the answer is no. So we think of a value less than 53 and if that's evenly divisible by 5 and we conclude that that's 50. And we go out 5 values, including 50, and that takes us to 54. And here we would go down um, by 5, decrease by 5, so 45. 49 and 42, 44, and 35 to 39, 30 to 34, 25 to 29, 20 to 24, 15, to 19. And do we need to go any further? Our low score is 16, so it, it's included in that last interval. Let's see how many class intervals we came up with. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Again, we had approximately determined that we needed 8. We, in this case, um, came up with, coincidentally, exactly 8. It won't, won't always be equal, but here we were pretty close. Uh, we were much closer than the ex last example. So again, notice in the lower limit, I'm, I'm decreasing by 5. Counting by 5s, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, and 15. And we would do the same process that we did before with the frequency. We would tally the frequency for each value, right, within each of these class intervals. Um, I'm not going to do that simply because I have an abundance of examples of homework problems, but in this question number two, simply wanted to know what would be the real limits for the bottom um, class interval. So let's answer that. Um, so our real limit, right, our real limits, these are our parent limits. Our real limits in this case would be 14.5 through 19.5. Right, so it's half a unit below the lower and half a unit above. So we answer that question. And then finally, number three says, using only frequency distribution table, excuse me, using only the frequency distribution table you construct in exercise one, how many individuals had a score of 53? And so let's, uh, let's just refresh our recollection of what it looked like. So we had a class interval of 50 to 59 and the frequency was equal to 2. And so the question is, how many individuals scored a 53? Well, we know that that value 53 falls within this range, and we would say that the frequency is equal to 2. If you were to say that two individuals scored 53, that would be incorrect. The purpose of this question is to demonstrate the uh, negative aspects of the group frequency distribution that we lose specific information. We cannot answer this question. We cannot um, determine how many individuals scored a 53. It could be two, but we don't know. Um, those two individuals fell somewhere within this range, and we don't know exactly what those scores were. So again, the, the consequence of a group frequency distribution is that the information is consolidated so much that we lose specifics, but it's okay given that we'd rather do this than have 37 intervals, which would be required if we didn't group this data into a group frequency distribution. 
All right, so that's it for part two. Um, next, we'll be talking about graphs, frequency distribution graphs in part three.